I would like to thank everybody for logging on to our webinar on student loan strategies in the COVID era and beyond. My name is Jay Weinberg and I'm a financial planner and I've been in this line of work for over 20 years and my practice is exclusively with physicians. And if you would like to block out some time to discuss your specific situation, feel free to go ahead and scan this QR code on the bottom left hand side of the screen or you can uh, complete our questionnaire at www.pgy1.com or call or email or text, whatever it may be. In a given year, I lecture to somewhere around 100 or so residency and fellowship programs as well as several medical schools on the topics of student loan strategies and tax filing considerations, disability insurance, home ownership and mortgage options, life insurance, and Roth IRAs. But for this webinar, I'm going to keep it to student loans. And we have a tremendous amount of graduating medical students on here. So um, uh, at the beginning, I am going to add a couple of slides uh, just to make sure that the the graduating medical students uh, get get things um, done properly uh, between now and the time they start uh, residency. <clears throat> so from a timeline for graduating medical students, there, there's going to be several things you want to do. And the first of which is going to be file your taxes as a fourth year medical student. So chances are you didn't have any income as an MS4. But it's so important if you have student loans to file your taxes, likely with a zero income, assuming that's the case, because when the IRS has a return on file for you, even if, if it's with zero uh, income, when you go ahead and do your direct consolidation, it's going to streamline the process and you'll likely end up with a zero payment as a PGY1. So once again, if you are a fourth year medical student, go ahead and file your taxes sooner rather than later so they can be processed. Part two for graduating medical students is going to be what they call a direct consolidation. This is where you're going to take all the different loans that you have through the government and turn them into one big loan. And this is called a direct consolidation. And the time you're going to do the direct consolidation is after graduation, which is likely sometime mid to late May, but before residency starts uh, the last week in June with, with orientation. So I always tell people to put it in their calendar for, for somewhere around the first week in June. Uh, you're going to want to uh, go onto the studentaid.gov website and do your direct consolidation. <clears throat> and this is going to start the clock, so to speak, with your loans and um, it's going to get you engaged uh, with with public service loan forgiveness if, if that happens to be the road that you're going down. And one side note on the direct consolidation, uh, don't get confused when you do this uh, uh, with the examples that they give you on the government website because they're going to say, you know, your payment for X plan is going to be uh, X amount per month. The payment for Y plan is going to be Z amount per month. These are mere examples. They are not for your specific situation. So uh, in just a couple of minutes, I'm going to tell you which repayment options you should take advantage of given your specific situation. But it's real easy for, for the graduating medical students. Do your taxes and do your direct consolidation after graduation, but before residency starts on the 1st of July. As I'm sure everybody knows, the government has made some modifications on their loans due to the coronavirus. So let's call this the, uh, the COVID era. So as it stands right now, there's going to be zero interest and zero payments on government direct loans through the end of September 2021. 
these zero payments, they do count as qualifying payments if you are going for public service loan forgiveness. And for many residents and fellows that have previously you know, worked an extra three or four or five hundred dollars into their budget, it has created a financial windfall for the past year and for the next few months. Because if you were previously paying three, four, five hundred dollars and now you're not, you should hopefully have some quote unquote extra money. So what are you going to do with that extra money or what should you do with that extra money? So if you have credit card debt that, that's going to uh, be with a, a high interest rate, maybe you want to reallocate the funds towards that. If disability insurance is something that you uh, know that you, you want to get it sometime soon, uh, maybe you reallocate some of the money towards that. A Roth IRA, it's always a great option. Uh, <clears throat> so maybe you put put money into a Roth or after this uh, COVID mess is over, maybe you want to go on vacation. So I can't blame you for going on vacation or, or maybe you just want to beef up your emergency fund. But whatever you do with that quote unquote extra money, just make sure you don't squander it. <clears throat> So this is what I would call pre and post COVID era. And what factors are going to determine what the best option or strategy is for you on the loan? So are you hoping for public service loan forgiveness? What type of loans do you have? Are they government direct loans? Might they be government loans that are not direct loans? Could they be private loans? Could they be interfamily loans or a combination thereof? Marital status is a big one. Are you single, married? Do you have dependents? If you are married, how much money does your spouse make? And do they also have government direct loans? And if you are going towards public service loan forgiveness, how long or how many qualifying payments have you made? Now, there's going to be several elections or, or uh, repayment options that you have to choose from for government loans. But on this page, I've mapped out the two that the lion's share of residents and fellows are going to choose from. And if I had to put a percentage on them, I would say probably about 75% of, of residents and fellows uh, would be or should be on repay and, and probably about 25% on, on PAYE. So let's talk about the, these um, two programs. So with repay, the payment amount, it's going to be 10% of your household income. And that's going to be regardless of your tax filing status. So for those of you that are married, even if you were to file your taxes separately, which I'm not suggesting you do, but if you're married and file your taxes separately, your repay payment would still be calculated based upon household income. So 10% of your household income as your payment for repay. The best part about repay, and we have a dedicated slide for this in just a couple of minutes, is that there's a credit or a subsidy of one half of your unpaid interest. One of the downsides to repay, but it's oftentimes a moot point, it, is that there's no cap of the 10-year standard repayment on repay, which simply stated when you're an attending, you probably don't want to be on repay anymore. Repay does count towards public service loan forgiveness, and if you have direct loans, you would also be eligible. The next option is PAYE, some of the same characteristics, but some totally different characteristics. So the payment amount for PAYE is going to be 10% of your discretionary income. And I highlight discretionary because if you are married, you have the ability to file your taxes separate and only pay based upon your income and your loan amount. Not everybody's eligible for PAYE. You have to be a quote unquote newer borrower. So if you had government loans prior to the fall of 2007, it would likely knock you out of eligibility for PAYE. PAYE does count towards public service loan forgiveness, and if you have direct loans, you would be eligible. 
let's go through some scenarios now based upon loan amount and marital status. So if you're single and you have government loans less than say $100,000 and you have income of that of a resident or a fellow, you really can't get it wrong no matter what you do. You could do PAYE or repay or you may even want to consider a private refinance. But I'm going to say this several times throughout this webinar. The interest rate for government loans is zero right now and the payment amount is zero. And you can't get any better than zeros. So if you have government direct loans, you probably do not want to do a private refinance on them while we are in the COVID moratorium on payments and interest because you can't do any better than zeros. So if you are going to do a refinance or you think you may want to do a refinance on government direct loans, you're going to want to wait until the interest and the payments kick back in. Now, let's say you're single and you have government direct loans more than $100,000, an income of that of a resident or fellow, you're going to want to be on repay. If you are married and your spouse does not have income or your spouse has very little income and you have income of that of a resident or fellow and you have more than $100,000 in government direct loans, you're likely going to want to be on repay and file your taxes joint. If you are married and your spouse has comparable income and comparable loan amounts, both of you are going to want to be on repay and likely file your taxes joint. The one-off scenario here where repay is not going to make sense is if you are married to somebody that has really good income and little or no government direct loans. Because remember, repay goes off of household income regardless of tax filing status. So if you're in this situation where you're married to somebody that's making really good money and doesn't have uh, any or, or has very little government direct loans, if you're going for public service loan forgiveness, you'll likely want to be on PAYE. And if you do that, you'll likely file your taxes separately. If there's no chance you are going for public service loan forgiveness, you may want to entertain a private refinance. And if you do that, you'll likely want to file your taxes joint. But once again, if the interest rate is zero and the payment is zero, you probably don't want to do a refinance on government loans until the payments and the interest kick back in. Public service loan forgiveness. We've all heard about it and unfortunately a lot of what we heard may be in the negative connotation. And simply stated, that's the media stirring the pot with this program because frankly, this program, it's alive and well, and I know people that have qualified, and we will all know people that either have qualified or will qualify in the future. So back in the fall of 2007, the government rolled out a program called Public Service Loan Forgiveness. They said if you have the right type of loans and you're working at the right type of place and you make the right amount of payments, you are going to be eligible for tax-free public service loan forgiveness. So what kind of loans count? Government direct loans count. Not all government loans are direct loans. So it needs to say direct in the, in the heading. You need to be working at the right type of place, which is going to be a government or a nonprofit 501c3 entity. The lion's share of residency and fellowship programs do fit the bill for this. If you have any questions about whether or not a specific institution does count, simply reach out to the GME and ask them and they can let you know. And finally, you have to make 120 qualifying payments. Qualifying payments are going to be IBR, PAYE, repay or 10 year standard repayment. So if you do A, B, and C, you are going to set the stage for tax-free public service loan forgiveness. A couple of tidbits. 
do not pay more than your minimum required payments if you are going for public service loan forgiveness for two reasons. Number one, it's going to be tax-free forgiveness of whatever the amount is on the back end. So why would you pay any extra towards the loans if they're going to be forgiven? You're simply taking money out of your own pocket. Number two, do not pay extra on your loans because it confuses the calculation system that these loan servicers are using. And it puts you into something called pay to head status. And simply stated it, um, it, it makes them hard to keep track of how many payments you've logged. So if your payment should be 250 a month, pay 250 a month. It is not mandatory. However, it is highly suggested that you do your employment certification form annually. This is when you're gonna uh, send the form over to your loan servicer saying that you've been working at this place and it does qualify and then your loan servicer is going to circle back to you and say okay dr patel or okay dr smith uh we have you logged for x amount of payments the reason why you want to do this certification form annually is because I can't tell you how many people they think they're they're doing everything perfectly and maybe they are but when they submit their certification form the amount of qualifying payments that your servicer may have you for may be totally different than what you feel you have so if there is any discrepancy the sooner you find out about it the better it is and the sooner you can try to get the, the ship going in the right direction and get whatever that problem is rectified. A few years ago, there was an article that came out where it said 99% of people that went for public service loan forgiveness did not qualify. And this was the media being the media and stirring the pot. So if you read farther into that article, it said that 70% of the people, they didn't have the right type of loans, 50% of the people, they weren't working at the right type of place, and 30% of the people, they didn't even do the paperwork correctly. However, the silver lining was they, they said that there were people that qualified. And it's real easy for physicians, especially those uh, that, that have um, longer du duration uh, residency and fellowship programs to uh, hopefully qualify for this program. So um, simply do the steps and, and it, it will work out for you. There's many scenarios where repay makes sense. So, so let's go through uh, a basic example. And once again, we are with zero interest and zero payments. So this particular scenario is not going to make sense right this second. However, prior to the COVID modifications being put into place, uh, this did make sense. And once these, these COVID modifications are lifted, this will again make sense. So here's an example of repay. Let's say you have $200,000 of government direct loans at 6%. That'll be $12,000 of interest. Let's say your payment's two fifty dollars a month. So that'll be a $3,000 annual payment. So if you have $12,000 of interest and you're paying $3,000, that leaves $9,000 of unpaid interest. With repay, there's going to be a credit or a subsidy of one half of your unpaid interest amount. So in this case, you would get a subsidy of $4,500. So rather than your loans growing from $200,000 up to $209,000, your loans would grow from $200,000 up to $204,500. So if you can take advantage of repay for three or four or five or six years, you may be able to save yourself 20 or 40 or maybe even $60,000 in interest for when the time comes to pay these loans back. And like I said before, I would say roughly 75% of residents either are on repay or should be on repay, especially those that are single. Private refinance, where does this make sense? So 
If you have government direct loans, do not do a private refinance until you are 100% certain that you are not going for public service loan forgiveness. Because if you are going for public service loan forgiveness, the loans have to be with the government. So once you do a private refinance, you are taking them away from the government. You need to have a good credit score. If repay is not a favorable option, whether it be for marital status or, or income, if you have high interest rate government loans, that would be a scenario when the interest rates do kick back in where you may want to consider a private refinance, especially if repay is not a favorable option and you have a, a interest rate higher than 5%. If you have high interest rate or high payment private loans, that would be a terrific opportunity to look at a private refinance sooner rather than later. The interest rates for private refinances are currently at historic lows. And I can't tell you how many clients of mine that I've spoken to over the past few months that have high interest rate private loans and they've been able to, to drastically lower the payments and the interest rates on these private loans. So if you have private loans, I would certainly look at it sooner rather than later. And for medical students, residents and fellows, there are several companies out there that offer private refinances. However, there are two that have terrific programs for residents and fellows. And those two are going to be Laurel Road and SoFi. And feel free to go ahead and scan these QR codes, which will enable you to either receive a welcome bonus or a lower interest rate. And the programs from Laurel Road and SoFi they allow for payment amounts of $100 per month while you are in your training years. And then they give you a six month grace period on the back end after your training. And it's not until seven months when you're out of training that your quote unquote normal payments kick in. So I have had hundreds of clients utilize these, these um, companies for private refinances. Uh, I've gotten terrific feedback and reviews. So if you think that you're a candidate, feel free to go ahead and scan these QR codes and at least at a minimum, find out what the interest rate would be if you were to do a private refinance with them. I would like to thank everybody for logging on to this webinar on student loan strategies. And if anyone wants to block out time to discuss their specific situation, or if you want to block out time to further discuss disability insurance, as that is uh, one of my main specialties, feel free to go ahead and complete our questionnaire at pgy1.com, and then we can confidentially block out some time to discuss your situation, or you could also go and scan this QR code on the bottom left-hand side of the screen, which will add me to the contacts of your cell phone or tablet. But I want to thank everybody for logging on. I want to thank you for doing what you do, and I want to congratulate those medical students uh, that logged on to this webinar in addition to the tremendous amount of, of residents and fellows that had the opportunity to log on to this webinar. So have a great day and thank you for, for doing what you do and hopefully you picked up some valuable information.